Hello and welcome to the next video on rendering where we will talk about the history of the Monte Carlo methods. This is a bonus video and not part of the exam. However, the study of how Monte Carlo methods became popular is quite interesting since it was in a way intertwined with some other major events of 20th century. There is also a connection to the very first digital computer, so I hope you enjoy this video. You have seen the Monte Carlo integration in the previous lectures. The Monte Carlo integration is from the larger family of the Monte Carlo methods. In all of those methods, the idea is to have a statistical approach for solving a principally deterministic, but very difficult if not impossible to calculate problem. A statistical approach in this context refers to the reliance on random sampling. Integration, by the way, was not necessarily the first problem that the scientists of this story tried to solve. Rather, the majority of them were studying neutron diffusion and other problems in nuclear physics. But more on that in a few minutes. For now, let's have a look at this formula and consider the problem from the historical perspective for a moment. For this to actually work, we need a very large n. The idea comes from the law of large numbers after all. Let's begin in 1930s. Enrico Fermi was an Italian physicist. He is very famous and you probably have heard about Fermi or one of many things that are named after him, like the synthetic element on the periodic table. He has been called the architect of nuclear age. Anyhow, he led a group of scientists in Rome where they made many discoveries in the field of nuclear physics. More relevant for us, Fermi developed the idea of a statistical sampling when working with this group. He applied the method with whatever hardware he could find, which was mostly a mechanical calculator, but he never published anything on the subject because it just didn't seem very practical given the computational needs. And so the idea was more or less forgotten. He left Italy and worked at the Manhattan Project during the war. Manhattan Project was based on a secret site at Los Alamos in New Mexico. In early 1940s, American physicist John Mockley and engineer Prisper Eckert were working in a research group at the University of Pennsylvania. At the time, they were dealing with calculation of firing tables for U.S. Army Ballistic Research Lab in Aberdeen. Mockley was familiar with electronic circuits in the context of counters used for measuring radiation. His idea was that since electronic circuits were able to count, then they could also do basic arithmetic. At the time, the term computer was also used for massive number of people doing calculations and Mockley was quite familiar with the limitations. And so, he proposed the idea of building a digital computer to help with the calculations. This project was approved with the codename Project PX. This Project PX led to ENIAC, which was constructed in Moore School of Electrical Engineering at the University of Pennsylvania under the direction of Mockley and Eckert. ENIAC was the very first fully electronic digital computer. It was about a thousand times faster than the electromechanical machines they used at the time, weighed 27 tons and occupied 167 square meters. The machine was finished by 1946, where the first review tests were conducted. It was then operational from 1947 until 1955. Programming was done using various switches and it took a long time to change the current program. Even during the construction, Mockley, Eckert and the other scientists involved already thought of improvements necessary for ENIAC and possible future computers, such as the idea of stored programs. Apparently though, they did not get much credit for the concepts later, since their names were removed from the first draft paper that described the ideas. This first draft later became what we know as von Neumann architecture. John von Neumann. I guess most computer scientists have heard the name. He was one of the best known mathematicians of 20th century. There are endless topics that he contributed to in several fields of study, including computer science. In the context of Monte Carlo, well, he was at the time involved in the Manhattan Project but also was a consultant to the lab in Aberdeen and so had heard that the work on ENIAC was close to finish at University of Pennsylvania. For the review of ENIAC, the plan was to use firing table problems. 
von Neumann convinced Aberdeen to run models provided by Los Alamos for the review as well, arguing that those would provide a more comprehensive test for ENIAC. And so, a group of scientists in, in uh, Los Alamos were asked by Neumann to prepare the necessary models. As a side note, von Neumann went on later to work directly on ENIAC and its improvements. Nicholas Metropolis was a Greek-American scientist who also joined Los Alamos in 1943. His engagement with ENIAC began when von Neumann asked a group of physicists at Los Alamos to create the thermonuclear model for ENIAC's first review. You probably have heard the name Metropolis in the context of ray tracing. Years later, he went on to lead a team that created another famous computer called the Maniac. He then developed an algorithm which is now known as Metropolis Hastings in its general form. But let's go back to ENIAC for now. ENIAC was completed and presented to public on February 14, 1946. The review of the results was held in the spring of that year and Metropolis also presented his results. Many interested scientists took part in that review. One of the attendees at the said review was Stanislav Ulam. Polish-American scientist that also joined Manhattan Project during the war. Ulam and von Neumann were colleagues and they made several discoveries together during the 40s and 50s. He was in general intrigued by random and branching processes as well as pattern development. Metropolis writes, Ulam would cite the times he drove into a field parking lot at the same moment someone else was leaving. He also liked playing games of chance, such as solitaire. The story goes that once, when he was recovering in a hospital, he decided to estimate statistically the probability of successful outcome in a solitaire game. He was aware of the potential as well as the computational needs of the statistical methods. Ulam, during his wartime work at Los Alamos, had dealt with electromechanical computers and was very impressed by the speed of ENIAC. And so, it occurred to him that the statistical methods must be resurrected, as machines such as ENIAC would make them very practical. He shared his ideas with von Neumann. Von Neumann understood the significance of Ulam's idea and proposed a detailed outline of a statistical approach for solving the problem of neutron diffusion in 1947. Since the project was confidential, it was necessary to have a code name. Nicholas Metropolis suggested the name Monte Carlo because Stan Ulam had an uncle that would borrow money because he just had to go to the casino in Monte Carlo. The name stuck. It was now necessary to have a source for pseudo random numbers. Von Neumann invented the method of middle square digits. It was simple and crude, but relatively fast. After the review, ENIAC was shut down in 1946 and moved to Aberdeen in 1947 and so was unavailable for about two years. Many of the scientists thought that the machine would never survive the transport and run another calculation. The idea of statistical approaches was being resurrected though. Enrico Fermi, who a decade before had used similar methods, was now also working Los Alamos and heard of Olam's idea. Since ENIAC was unavailable, Fermi and an associate named Percy Keane designed an analog computer that was called the Monte Carlo Trulli, or the Fermiac. Fermiac could run mechanical simulation of random neutron diffusions. This picture, by the way, shows Stan Ulam holding this Fermiac. Despite the doubts, ENIAC made it to Aberdeen and was turned on again on July 1947. There, for the first time, the scientists ran Monte Carlo on the machine. Nine different problem configurations were tested with positive results, so it was clear that Monte Carlo was here to stay. Suddenly, a range of scientists from various fields wanted to run their Monte Carlo algorithms on ENIAC. Over time, there were many conferences and publications dedicated to the application of the method. Monte Carlo was named in the top 10 list of algorithms of 20th century. An interesting quote from the year 2000 says, Given digital computers' reputation for deterministic calculation, it is fitting that one of its earliest applications was the generation of random numbers.
Later on, uh, Metropolis led a group of scientists who built another computer, the Maniac, which became operational in 1952. It is said that Metropolis picked the name in the hope to stop strange acronyms chosen for digital computers at the time. Maniac, by the way, was the first computer to defeat a human in a game similar to chess. This game was redesigned in a way to consume less memory. Anyhow, they used Maniac to run more statistical tests, which led to a class of Monte Carlo methods that are today known as Markov Chain Monte Carlo. Markov chains are a statistical construct where the probability for moving to the next state in the chain only depends on the current state. And so, they can be used for generating random numbers that are not totally independent. Rather, they have a local dependency. Metropolis Hastings is the general form of the algorithm that was constructed at that time. It's a quite important method when it comes to ray tracing and rendering. The algorithm was published in 1953 and extended to its general form by Hastings in 1970. Just to give you a very rough description, you remember from the important sampling section of the Monte Carlo integration lecture that the goal is to find the PDF for sampling which is proportional to the sampled function. In many cases, it is difficult or impossible to directly infer this PDF. Metropolis Hastings attempts to iteratively sample from that distribution. The idea is to use a proposal distribution which is used to propose the next random number in the chain given the current number. Then, an acceptance function dictates whether the proposed point is accepted or not. By iteratively creating this chain, a stationary state is reached, which is our desired distribution. And so, finally, we come to Metropolis Light Transport, which was invented by Eric Beach in 1997. MLT is the application of Metropolis Hastings algorithm to rendering equation. To give you a simplified description, until then the sampling schemes were based on independent samples. By using Markov Chain Monte Carlo and the short-term memory they provide, MLT can utilize certain mutation rules to propose and explore nearby paths once a light carrying path from the light to eye has been found. Using Metropolis Hastings, it is ensured that the overall distribution of the sample paths is proportional to their contribution to the image, and so a realistic distribution of light within a scene is achieved. This scheme allows a relatively quick convergence, even in those cases where it is difficult to find the paths. So, for example, in the case of caustics. And this was our video on the history of the Monte Carlo method. Thank you for listening and I hope you enjoyed.